some awesome announcements coming up for you guys so go ahead and take a seat and check these out hi there i'm jenny warrens from our birmingham campus on behalf of all of us here at kensington welcome i think there's a reason you're here today and that maybe god has something specifically for you in today's service and we've been looking forward to today for months now know why it's our fall groups kickoff. That means our small groups, courses, and care workshops are starting up again. Each one of these are what we call jump in opportunities, a place for you to connect and grow. We believe building community and authentic relationships is a vital part of our spiritual journey. So here are just some of the opportunities we have for everyone this fall. Hi, I'm Charlotte Kelly, Discipleship Director at Orient Campus, and I know that Kensington can seem like a really big place and it could feel easy to get lost. So we're working hard to create opportunities for you 
to connect with others. I'm excited to share with you just a little bit about our small groups. Most groups meet regularly, usually weekly, in people's homes, coffee shops, or wherever it works best to study the Bible, to discuss the weekend service, or just to do life together. And we have all sorts of small groups. We have groups for families, couples, singles, for men only or women only. We even have a group for newlyweds and another at Orion doing great dates for couples. We believe that God designed all of us to be in relationship with others and to not do life alone. So I would love for all of you to check out what our small groups have to offer. I wanted to tell you about our courses, which are another great way to jump in this fall. Courses meet for several weeks on a topic that's important to you. It's a great way to invest in your growth while connecting with like-minded people. Here are some courses that may interest you. Alpha is a discussion course where you can explore questions about life and who God is. You listen to a teaching on a key theme of the Christian faith and then participate in a group reflection. Alpha is for everyone. There's no question too big and no topic that's off limits. Another course created right here at Ken for your own community is Bible Basics. When you invest time in understanding the mysteries of the Bible, that's time well spent. So whether you're new to the Bible or have been reading it for decades, this course will give you an understanding of Scripture's big picture and how all the books of the Bible flow together. We've also heard great things from our couples who have taken the marriage course. This is an opportunity to strengthen and grow your marriage, whether you've been married for six months or 40 years. And whether you're in a good season or you're struggling, you'll get practical support to communicate more effectively, understand each other's needs, resolve conflict, and more. Hi, I'm Adrienne Dundon, and I am really passionate about our care initiatives because I have seen the incredible impact they have had on real people during their hardest seasons of life. Being a participant and a leader in our Celebrate Recovery ministry over the last eight years has equipped me with the tools to be able to walk through and process the uncertainty of this season that we have been walking through. After the year and a half that we've had, so many of us need a safe place to heal and process. So maybe it's not time to jump into a traditional small group. Maybe it's your time to pursue your own wholeness. The goal of our care initiatives is to provide a safe, distraction-free place where you can heal from the hurts of life and be equipped for the adventures of life. We offer divorce recovery, grief recovery, blended family workshops, and ongoing celebrate recovery for the whole family. We also support marriages and families with mentorships, classes, special small groups, and marriage preparation. When facing hard times, tough decisions, or stressful circumstances, investing in yourself is so important. We believe that Jesus is at the center of working through the healing process, and that process can be helped by walking alongside others. We've been through more than a year of isolation, transition, and loss, haven't we? Many of us are in need of real community now more than ever. Now, God knows you and sees you and made us to live in relationship. So don't let today go by without investigating all your choices to get connected here at Kensington. Find a group near you by visiting kensingtonchurch.org slash groups and filtering by your zip code and preferences. Or come out after services to the lobby and we'll be waiting to answer your questions about groups, courses, and care initiatives. Take the first step and we'll help you find the group that's right for you, no matter your life stage, interests, or needs. All right, good morning, Clarkston. Uh, who had fun walking in the lobby today? Woo! That, wasn't, that didn't sound very fun. <laughs> who had fun in the lobby this morning? There we go. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Lindsay. I am the discipleship director here at the Clarkston campus, and I'm up here today to tell you all about everything that's happening, which is a lot. Um, so for staff and volunteers, today is kind of like the first day of school. <laughs> We've been planning for this day, for small group launch, for the Connect event, for all the things going on for quite a while. So we are like jazzed up and just ready to celebrate with you guys. A um, Couple announcements though. Uh, next Saturday, September 18th, we have the Ladies Getaway event. This is in place of Smash, which used to be a weekend event. This is a one-day, ladies-only retreat to come and get filled up, feel uh, rejuvenated, meet other ladies from our community. You can register at kensingtonchurch.org slash getaway. Uh, we currently have about 15 people from Clarkston going, so it's going to be a really nice group. Um, register. And if you have any questions about it, feel free to come see me in the lobby. Also coming up, which is real exciting for our guys, this is our first ever, hopefully first annual, um, barbecue pulled pork competition. So there's two parts to this. One, all the men need to register just to attend the event. It's $15. It's going to be in Clarkson at this breathtaking, amazing property. Um, it includes your full meal. We have some guest speakers, a lot of community and connection time. 
The other part of it is I'm still looking for one or two more gentlemen who would consider themselves the grill master. We will provide you with all the meat, but we need a couple guys to join the competition. So if that is you, if you are like, oh yeah, I've totally got this, there is a legit good prize for the winner. We've currently got four guys registered to smoke the meat, but I need at least one to two more. So if you're interested, come see me, send me an email, um, talk to Jeremiah, whatever the case is, just let us know that you're interested and we will get you plugged into that. Um, also, after service today, like I mentioned, we have the Connect event, so visit us outside, lots of games for the kids, we've got some popcorn and drinks, and of course the small group table. Um, most importantly, the reason I'm up here today is to talk about small groups, because that's, that's what I do here at our campus. Um, I would imagine most of you probably know somebody who's been in a small group. Raise your hand if, if you've been in a small group or you know someone in a small group. Okay, so that's almost everyone, that's awesome. Um, I joined my first Kensington small group about 13 years ago. I was newly married, we didn't have any kids, and really I was just looking for community. Um, I joined a newly, newly married couples group, uh, except my husband was deployed in Afghanistan for six months. So I joined the group and went by myself. <laughs> that was weird. Um, but I just, I had this deep desire and longing for community. And these were the people that were my age group, similar life stage. And so even though I had to go to a couples group, everyone was with their spouse, I went alone for the first four months. And it was life-changing, I'm not gonna, not gonna lie. Um, some of those people I don't keep in touch with. It's not like, you know, roses and unicorns always, but several of those couples to this day are still some of our closest friends. And that was at the Birmingham campus, and now even that we're up in Clarkston, they're still close to us. So, I'm up here just to tell you, it's time to jump in. I jumped in, and I had every reason not to. I could have just stayed home. There was no one at home, like, encouraging me to go. I didn't have girlfriends that were in the group saying, let's do it together. I went by myself because I just felt like it's what God wanted me to do. So today, I'm asking everyone to consider jumping in with us. Out in the lobby, or rather outside, we are going to have some of our small group leaders, some of our uh, care initiative representatives and course representatives out there to answer questions, talk to you about uh, days and times and what type of groups. I mean, we've got groups for everyone, from men only, women only, widows, young moms, singles, married couples. We've got courses on how to read the Bible. We've got Celebrate Recovery. There is a plethora of options, plenty of ways to get connected. And so if, if my personal plea is not enough for you, I just want to leave you with two things today. Number one, Jesus was in a small group. The Bible clearly tells us that we are not supposed to do life alone. We are to do it in community, and this is a really great way to do it. And number two, I want everyone to remember this. Ministry is an opportunity. It is not an obligation. You do not have to walk out of here and join a small group, but it is an opportunity for you to feel like you're part of our community. And so if you walk out of here and you don't say hi to anyone, that's okay, that's your choice. But you are doing yourself and all of us a disservice by not stopping and saying hello. We've all got name tags on today. There's no reason why you can't say hello to someone. You should know their name. And for those of you that are brave enough to come up to the small group table, because I know, like, we're really intimidating. Actually, are there any small group leaders sitting in here right now? If there are, stand up for me. What I want you to do is just look at them. They are, they look just like me and you. They're, they're just normal people. These are not scary, intimidating men and women. They are your soon-to-be best friends, maybe. <laughs> so... Join us over at the table, and if you do, I have fresh baked chocolate chip cookies for anyone brave enough to come and visit us. I like it, man. <laughs> Lindsay Narker! Woo! I'm telling you guys, she's been one of the biggest blessings, additions to our team, to this community, this campus. It's unbelievable. And, and you make a good plea. You've got Jesus, the greatest opportunity of your life, and chocolate chip cookies. So... If that doesn't do it, I don't know what will, right? So, well, we are excited about kicking off a new series called I Feel. Uh, I'm a high feeler. I am super emotional. But we are going to talk over the next couple of weeks. 
what do we do with the major feelings that we have and the things that are going on? And uh, this week one is I feel unseen, hence the name tags. We want to make sure everybody is seen and everybody is heard and everybody has a voice and everybody feels included because this is, as Lindsay was sharing, part of the wiring of God. It is how he wired us as human beings, as people, to be loved, to be known, to be seen. It makes all the difference in our existence. And uh, the fact yesterday is 9-11, and Marie and I have been just watching, so many of us, right, we've just been reflecting and watching, and, and, and Maria turned on a program, uh, 9-11, A Day in America, and we had just watched it. We... We were just like, what? Kept looking over and it was like one of those, like, are you crying? And she's like, are you crying? I'm like, no, yeah. You know? And we just wept. And what was 20 years ago just seemed like all of a sudden just moments ago. Like, how could this be? And so many lives, thousands, that would never be heard of or seen again after that morning. And so we just wanted to reflect them. And there are so many amazing stories. And there's one little story. I want to show you a picture of this young mom. And this is Yamel. And this is her little boy, Kevin. And he just had graduated kindergarten. He was eight. And uh, but this photo, they had gone to Disney World. They'd done some amazing things. And she was an EMT. And she had went into the South Tower when it was burning. When people were turning away, she was turning toward it, turning into it. And this next picture is of this little boy. This iconic photo is him. And his grandmother's trying to just comfort him. And this is 20 years later. This is now, just yesterday. He was reflecting with his grandmother. And the flag that was draped over her coffin. I say, why do you do this? Because scripture commands us to rejoice with those that rejoice. But it commands us even greater to mourn with those who mourn. In our humanity and our need to be seen and loved. Our empathy connects us together. And so we just want to take a moment, we just want to pray as we reflect for the lives of people that are still mourning and still hurting. And that young boy, 20 years later, says it still takes his breath away. And so we want to take a breath. We want to take a moment. We want to reflect and pray together. So we'll do that now. Father, we... Uh, we ask as we reflect and we remember Jesus, we pray for these families that still hurt, still mourn. God, we, uh, we are at a loss of words at times to even know how to articulate that pain as we reflect and we remember. But Jesus, I pray that you meet us, your Holy Spirit, your power, who you are. You meet us in this series, in these moments as we gather here together that we feel more than anything, whether it's unseen or anxious and all the things we'll talk about. But God, I pray ultimately that we feel your presence and your power and let it radically transform our lives. God, thank you for the heroes that ran and saved so many lives. God, again, we pray your spirit is with those that still mourn. May you bless today, Jesus, in your name. Amen. This next song... It's called Anyone, and it moves into this idea, this concept, this theme that we're in today. Can anybody hear me? Can anybody feel me? Can anybody even see me? God, are you even out there? And I want you to listen to these beautiful words as Ashley sings them, because in a lot of ways, it captures all of us in some moment in our life where we say, is anyone out there? Can anyone hear me or see me and know what I'm going through, especially you, God. God, can you see me? Can you hear me? Are you out there? Oh. 
I tried and tried and tried some more Told secrets till my voice was so Tired of empty conversations Cause no one hears me anymore A hundred million stories and a hundred million songs I feel stupid when I sing Nobody's listening to me Nobody's listening I talk to shooting stars But they always get it wrong I feel stupid when I pray So why am I praying anyway If nobody's listening Anyone Please send me Unbelievable voice, Ashley, and unbelievable words. That song was written by an artist named Demi Lovato, and she had actually wrote that, recorded it four days before she had gone into rehab, and nobody had known at all the struggle she was in. And the reality is what we're speaking about today is I feel unseen, and feeling unseen may seem like no big deal, but it's the biggest deal in the world it truly is. To be unseen, to be unnoticed, to be unwanted, to be unloved, to be overlooked, to be forgotten, to be marginalized, to be thrown to the side, to think that nobody cares, that nobody sees, that nobody is listening is of the greatest detriment to your life ever. And we're hoping today, as we press into this series, that we reveal some truth that's so powerful that it literally transforms your life from the inside out, that you recognize that you are seen by a God who not just wants to see you, but loves you. Not just loves you, but unconditionally loves you. Not just unconditionally loves you, but has all the power and all the strength and all the majesty in his voice and in his sight and his touch 
to transform your life in a way that you could never imagine. And that's what we're hoping for when we come together and we sing and we talk and we teach. It is for transformation. It is to actually have you walk away and say, I not only feel seen in this place, I feel seen by the God of the universe and I feel transformed by his power. Because otherwise, this, I'll be frank, is just a religious activity. Whether it's here or online you're watching right now, and if it's just to go through the motions, and it's just to maybe make you feel better for a moment, I would say that you're not seeing the full picture of what God can do in your life. I promise you. In staying in step and memory of 9-11, there's an amazing story, so many of them, but one of a gentleman named John Dittmar. He was an insurance executive, and he was in the South Tower. He was on the 105th floor, and he was right in the thick of a huge meeting that began at 8 a.m., uh, and they were right in the middle of it. Him and 54 other insurance executives that had met together, they came there annually, and that's where they did their big conference, and that's where they brought all these representatives, the different insurance companies all over, and began to negotiate pricing and concepts and all the things that they do, and brilliant individuals, right? They're there, and all of a sudden, at 8.46 a.m., they heard a massive explosion. It shook the building in the South Tower, even though it was the North Tower that was being hit in that moment. And all of a sudden, the disruption was so great that people were startled, and they stopped what they were doing, and they didn't know what to do. And finally, a security personnel had radioed up. There was a transmission over the thing. It said, everybody needs to begin to progress and make their way down to the main floor. you got to imagine you hear something like that, and then you're pretty instantly told to get out of your seat, to get moving, to go, and they did that. John Dittmar began to lead this group of 54 executives, and some of them panicked, and they stayed, and they said, we're not going to go anywhere. We're going to wait until security personnel comes. Some of them hid in the corner. Some of them just were froze in fear. Some of them ran to different parts of the building, but John knew we must progress. we got to go down, and so he made his way down and they got to the 72nd floor and all of a sudden the South Tower at 9.03 a.m. was hit just a few floors above where John was. He says within seconds, smoke was bellowing throughout the building. It was permeating its way through floors and punctures and the floor that took place and people were overwhelmed. People were screaming. It was pitch black. Sirens were going off. People were inhaling the smoke, not able to breathe. He said, panic is an understatement. He had never felt anything like this in his entire life. And he had recognized the group that he was with, that some had saved, some had left. But at that moment, at 9.03 a.m., it disrupted the whole flow of the group he was with. And he lost so many of them. And he thought in that moment, I can just keep going and move. And he, so he did so. He began to keep moving and going down the stairs. And he heard voices. Is anybody there? Can anyone hear me? Hey, help. And he hears this, help! I mean, like in a way that you've never heard before, a visceral way that makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck. And John knew in this moment he had to either go and save his own life or treacherously move back and pursue and say, maybe I could help others. And he began to go back and somebody said, can you hear me? Can you see me? And the smoke was so thick, John thought, I can't see. But he kept following the voice and eventually saw a group of some of the insurance executives he was with. There were six of them. And he grabbed one by hand, and he told the other to grab another hand, and another, another hand, and until seven of them were there, he says, is there anybody left from our group? And he said, no, it's just us. John said his heart broke in that moment, but he thought, okay. And he grabbed them, and they began to move, and they began to move, and seven of them moved all the way down through floor to floor to floor to floor, and uh, and even when there was a security guard with a mega horn telling him to keep going, Maria, do you remember that? We were watching that show on that security guard that was in the corner of the mega horn uh, was there, sorry. We were watching like several episodes yesterday, crying and remembering it. And they made their way down, he got out. And it was so amazing that this person's statement, they said, oh, we thought nobody could see us. He said, if you had not seen us and came back for us, we surely would have died. And I wanna tell you, that story triggered me, and the reality is, if you do not call out to God and begin to recognize that he sees you, and if you don't reach out and take his hand, surely your life, and I know this sounds dramatic, is not going to end up anywhere good. 
and there's a voice calling to the deep part of who you are, of where you are right now. Some of you walked in here and everything seemed awesome. You were putting on a name tag. Yeah, we smiled. We were excited. You know, we're trying to get all pumped up about like small groups and Jesus and chocolate chip cookies. And we're like, hey, everything's going to be awesome. But the truth is there's a weight to life that can hold us down and we need to be seen. And we don't just need to be seen. And it's a beautiful, amazing thing to see each one of you. It is. But there's something even more grand and more spectacular when the God of the universe lays his eyes upon you. It changes everything. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And so before we do that, I just want to pray because here's what I've learned and here's what I know. I know that in a room like this and online right now, there are people that are hurting and lonely and they need to be seen. And so I just want to pray that the Holy Spirit would begin to move through this whole month in this whole series in this community that we would recognize that the God of the universe sees us and loves us. Like, I can tell you that all I want, but until you experience it, you won't quite know what I'm talking about. So let me pray for you. Father, we just ask as we just spend just a few moments and then we're gonna go outside and celebrate and have an incredible time and see one another. But God, I just pray that we don't miss seeing the beautiful truth that you see us and what that means to us. So Jesus, I pray just... Please move. I just, I want to be humble and I just, whatever is said out of my goofy mouth, Lord, man, let it be your power and your words so like our community can grow in the knowledge that you see us and you love us. In your name, Christ, we ask. And everybody said, amen. All right, here we go. I'm, I'm excited about this because it's serious because it's a big deal. What we feel is a big deal. We can't hide our emotions. We can't hide what we're feeling. But as we begin to connect the inner emotions, the inner things, the inner struggles that are happening in our life, it begins to change everything. We connect them to the truth and power of who Jesus Christ is and the power of his Holy Spirit in our life. Um, So as we're moving on here, uh, it's amazing when you stop and think about how we're wired, right? That like, like we want to be seen, like kids do this, like when they're little, like I spy and they want to be seen or mom, look at me, mom, look at me, mom, look at me, mom, I see you, <laughs> right? Some of you are like, I, I see you do that, but it happens all the time, man, we want to be seen. We, we've got a middle child that's in karate right now and he comes in and he's always showing his moves and he's, he's, he's the typical middle child where the older one gets a lot of the attention, the younger one gets attention, but we're overlooking him and he's like, mom, check this out. He's like, Whoosh. And he's doing this intense karate, you know? We're like, yeah, yeah. He goes, no, I don't think you saw it. And he's like doing like spin moves and just like crazy stuff. And he's, God bless middle. Are you a middle child? God bless middle children. You are the toughest people on the planet. You get overlooked. You are not unseen today, okay? We see you. We know you. We love you. But there's something that we desire to be seen. I a couple of weeks ago, lady, any of the ladies go to that mid-size event at my mother-in-law's house, Terry Robinson. It wasn't that fun. You guys had an amazing time. I'm such a bonehead. I walked in there because Lindsay Narker, who has done an ama- amazing job, got the food there and stuff like that. But I walked in and it was like the most amazing spread you'd ever seen. And, and everything was laid out. And she was hosting this thing for this men's event. And I go, oh my gosh. And I walked in. I look. I said, look at this food. Look at this cheese cut up. Look at this pot. I said, Terry, this is unbelievable. And I said, Terry... Isn't Lindsay awesome? And she was so mad because Lindsay didn't set any of it up. <laughs> she did, and Terry goes, yeah, yeah, she is. <laughs> and she called my wife. She said, I just kind of want to punch my son-in-law. <laughs> she loved me, but she had every right to want to punch me. Listen, I totally didn't see I, I see you. And I, Marina used to watch this show called Parenthood. It's amazing. And it would say, I hear you and I see you. Uh, right? Because this happens all the time. Marina went to a wedding last night. She goes, what do you think of this dress? And I'm like, looks good. She goes, you didn't look. And I'm like, oh, crap, crap, Jeremiah, you know better. I'm like, yeah, I did. Oh, wow, <laughs> babe. <laughs> look, and she did look good in this orange dress. So let me tell you, that was amazing. Like, right, but to see, to see people. And this is a big deal. And I want to take you to this powerful truth. To not be seen is devastating. I was at Alex's, uh, the new one, Alex's, um, it's like a gas station. You can bowl there, you can pump gas, you can get uh, steak dinner, you can do like everything you need to do at Alex's, man. It's unbelievable. It's like the most amazing gas station you've ever stepped foot on ever uh, off White Lake Road. And um, I'm in there and they have this section. I can go outside and I just, I just doing notes Friday afternoon and praying for today. And 
and I got ready to get my car, and uh, <laughs> man, I'm such a klutz. I get ready to get my car, and I throw it in reverse, and then I, I got out to throw something away, and I looked back, and my car was rolling away. So I ran back to my car, slammed on the brake, looked around to see if anybody saw me <laughs> do that. Such a mess. So, and I, I can't believe it. I'm like, God, is this a practical joke? You want me to help serve and lead this community? Because, like, I almost crashed my car. It would have hit a gas pump, nonetheless, you know? Ridiculous. And so, anyhow, and there... And I get in, I, I see this young lady kind of like speed walking, gets in her car, jumps in her car, and I look over and I try not to look because I don't want to make her feel uncomfortable. She burst into tears. And I just thought, who knows what's going on in her life? Maybe the ATM didn't work because she's financially broke. Maybe she got a horrible text from a boyfriend that doesn't want to work things out. Maybe if something happened, maybe a kid called from school and struggling, I, I don't know. But for all of us, what I do know is that something is going on that's unseen and it needs to be seen so it can be brought into the light and the love of who Jesus Christ is to be transformed. Because God takes the things that are working against us, the things that are unseen, he pulls them out even though it's vulnerable and hard for us to do. And he says, let me see that because I want to heal that. I want to transform that. I want to do something beautiful in your life. This is what Jesus does. He does beautiful, amazing things in our life. And we see this all through scripture. We see God calling Adam out and saying, come out. As he's hiding, he says, bring it into the light. Let me see you. There's an amazing lady named, I want to show you in Genesis, named Hagar. That was this handmaid. She was a servant of Abraham's clan. And it says this, that she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. She was in a desperate, desolate situation. She says, you are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. And she gave him this beautiful Hebrew name called el Roi. Elroy means the God who sees me. And this truth, I want it to permeate in your heart today that you are seen by the living God because it changes everything in our life. And so I want to start here and there's this story in the book of Samuel. And there's this life of David, who David is one of the most, next to Jesus, most famous characters in Scripture. More of his statements, more of his psalms, more of his stories, more of his life events have been captured, capsulated, encapsulated on stone, on statues, all across the world, all over the place, literally second to Jesus, most writings ever known. And there's something powerful that we see about him that David recognizes what it meant to be seen by God. And so Saul is this king, and he's going to get kicked out, and David is going to be ushered in, but he doesn't know that just yet. Here's why. It says, Samuel says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. This is one of David's, or one of Jesse's sons. He's got eight sons. Only seven are there. David's the eighth. He's out in the field, forgotten about pretty much. It says, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. Eliab is strong. He's a Disney prince. He's handsome. He's great. He's got a good smile. He's got big shoulders. He, he, he can do this, right? No, the Lord said to Samuel, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. It says, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. That's super important. That's a totally different message series. But listen here. The Lord does not look at things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance. It's all we can see in our human nature and existence. But the Lord looks at the what? Heart. He looks at the things that are deeper. He's always taking a deeper dive into our life. Always. And so it says, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Now, this is an amazing moment. This is like, uh, you guys ever seen The Sound of Music, right? And uh, I, I remember seeing The Sound of Music at my wife's grandfather's house in Tennessee, and it was like 88 degrees. I don't know why I remember that. He had the thermostat super high <laughs> watching Sound of Music uh, with my family. But Fraulein Maria, is that is her name Fraulein? Fra Am I saying that way off? You guys can correct me. Go ahead. It's no big deal. I almost took out a gas pump this week. If you correct me on stage, it won't hurt my feelings, I promise, right? And she has all like the Von Trapp family fly before her and everything, you know. But this is like that moment, and they're like, nope, nope, nope. And it's like, well, what the heck's going on? And Jesse's like, well, there's one other kid. There's Samuel, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's one other uh, Samuel. And it's David. He's out in the field. And he goes, well, call him in. Bring him in. And so David gets ushered in. He gets rushed in to this point. He says, so he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. I want you to know a truth that is true through the New Testament from right here. It's 
foreshadowing, it's pre-telling us something. That when God sees you and we recognize this, he anoints you, he does this to the power of who Jesus Christ is as we accept him as our Savior in our life. He leaves with us the Holy Spirit and it gives us power. And this is what happened to David. But as a believer, as a person that says, I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to be a person of faith, when we recognize that God sees us, it begins to transform us and his Spirit is with us wherever we go. When God sees us, it radically changes our life as it did for David. And this is an amazing thing that God saw people past, what everybody else was missing, he saw too. What everybody else has been missing in your life, and maybe you have too, God sees right now. He sees the hurt. He sees the pain. He sees devastation. He sees hopes, and he sees dreams, and he sees everything in between. And Jesus Christ is calling out, and he's saying, look, I see you, and I know you feel unseen, and you feel overlooked, but I'm not overlooking you. I'm not not seeing you. I see you in your fullness, and I want you, and I love you, and I want to take you to places and do things you've never been or could never imagine. David would go on the greatest journey of his life. He had no idea what was to come, right? He would be anointed king of Israel. Out of his lineage, Jesus Christ would come. It would radically transform the world. I mean, this is unbelievable. And it all took place. Listen, it all took place because he had this revelation where he was seen in this moment by God. Being seen changes everything. And we know how it feels to be unseen or forgotten, right? Have you ever had a group of friends where they go, oh, it's the greatest night ever? And they're like, oh, crud, we totally, they recognize, they didn't invite you. Oh, it actually wasn't that big of a deal. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> you missed everything with God when you're not seen. And so I want to walk through this moment with David's life just for a few minutes and just give a few truths that I think are transformational. They're not just like information, and they're more than just inspiration. They will ignite your soul if you begin to lean in and hold on to these truths about what David had done. David had high moments and low moments. He had moments where everybody in the kingdom could see his greatest accomplishments and achievements from defeating Goliath, from like just securing lands, from being an empowered, amazing king, from doing wonderful things. I mean, literally, there were tens of thousands of people that were singing his praises as he would walk into Israel in the streets of Israel. I mean, can you imagine if you walked out of here and all of a sudden, Oh, no. Like there's a chorus breaks. It might freak you out. It freaked me out a little bit. But, right. but I mean, like this is going on, David, to his lowest moments where everybody in the kingdom knew what he did and knew how he messed up and almost destroyed everything. And he writes in Psalm 139 about these moments. He says, God, you see me in the amazing moments and you've seen me in my low moments. And I want to share just a couple thoughts really quick, that will transform. They transformed his life. They've transformed my life. They will transform your life. I promise. And so David steps into this amazing, beautiful psalm because when God sees you, it means so much more. When God sees you, it means God knows you. Let me, let me read this first part for you. It says, you have searched me, Lord, and you, say that with me, know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Not some of my ways, all of my ways. These are powerful words. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know. You know it completely. You hem me in and before. You lay your hand upon me. God knows us. He knows our hurts. He knows our hopes. He knows our pains. He knows the promises that we are holding on to. That word know means two things in this scripture. Know means of the construct and concept of knowledge to have information, but it goes deeper than that. The word know means to experientially know you as if God was your best friend. He was your soulmate. He was the one that knew you, everything about you, that he created you. David says, you hem me in going this way and hit me on the way out. You know my thoughts. You perceive them from afar off. You knew that I was going to have a bad day yesterday. You know I'm going to have a bad day on Thursday before I even know it. You know that I'm going to doubt God, that you don't, uh, you know my doubts, you know my, my pains, you know my weakness, you know the things that are going to take place. Like you know me, you know information about me, but you know me experientially, right? 
But do you know your children or your grandkids? I know that I've got three boys and a little girl at home, and I know that when my oldest comes home, my wife will go, how was your day? Who did you meet? What happened? How was class? What, did you have a good time at lunch? How did it go? Did anybody like you? Did anybody talk to you? And we'll say, like, and probably like, I don't know, 3,422 questions. Come out right there. And then Caleb will look back and go, so how was it? And, he, and he'll go, good. <laughs> And just walk away. And then Noah will come in, our middle child, and he'll go, Mom, you're not going to believe what happened. She goes, hold on, I'm trying to talk to Caleb. Yeah, no, I'm just, yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right? But we know he's ready to talk, ready to chat. And then Isaac comes in, man, and he runs upstairs, changes his clothes, comes down, his shirt's on backwards every single time. I don't know what his deal is. We're like, dude, put your shirt on forward, you know. But you know your kids. And then our, our, our little one, our little baby girl, and she is, she is sometimes just moody. And so... <laughs> We're going to go, hey, you're going to get reading time in your crib for 20 minutes. I know you don't know what I'm saying, but it's going to be special and awesome. And, yeah. You know your children, but God, God is saying, David is saying, do you know that God knows you? That he knows what you're going to? And this is a big, humongous deal for us to actually confide and confess and convey what's happening in our life to carry around the burdens and problems and hopes and dreams and the things that we collectively have as a community as we sit here and online and people, right? Let's, let's get honest. Like, man, there are some things burning in our soul that we want to do with our life. There are some things that are burning down our soul that we need to confide and deal with. Like, God's like, I know all these things. He's like, I know this about you. You say, why is it a big deal? Because it allows us to begin to transfer the things that we know that we think are hidden from God and unseen and say, God, can you see this, what I'm going through? Because we're unseen when we don't let others know, when we especially don't let God know or think God doesn't know, we're being unseen. And to be unseen is to be unwanted and unloved and forgotten. And, and that's not God's heartbeat or desire for us. I mean, if you could have seen us, like everybody's life is a little bit different. Some people's lives look like they're going amazing. You just follow them on Facebook. Everything's awesome, you know, like... Uh, and then if you follow behind the Facebook photos, we need to do a show called Behind Facebook Photos. You know, uh, what, the real story, <laughs> what really is happening, real events, you know, true moments. And we were driving home last weekend. We went to Silver Lake Sand Dunes, and it was amazing. Um, and our, our little girl that uh, we love and care about, she's with us, and she just decided to just, like, kind of cry and scream, and she did it for five minutes, 10 minutes, 15, and we're like, oh, my gosh, dear Lord, this isn't stopping, you know? And like, what do we do? And, and as we're driving all the way around, uh, there's billboards all over the place. And I'm looking at these billboards and they're like, and they're amazing. I think they're for churches. When I first look at them, they're like, uh, do you want more out of life? I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> Especially with the screaming, you know, uh, are you looking for a, a higher plane of existence? And I'm like, maybe I am, you know? And I'm looking at these and all of a sudden I realize they're all cannabis signs, you know? <laughs> Turn to green leaf cannabis or, uh, you know... <laughs> I'm like, man, these guys have cornered the market on church marketing, man. This is amazing. And, and, and so she's screaming. I'm like, what are we doing? Maria goes, we got to turn on wheels on the bus. And I'm like, okay. So we're like, wheels on the bus go round and round, round and round, all through. And she's starting it. And like, she's doing, but the minute we stop, she goes, ah! And then I'm like, wheels on the bus go round. And, and then she's good again, you know? And then especially the horn part, and she's like, wheels on the, and we're like, and the horn goes, beep, 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 beep. And, we're, and if I don't do it, she's like, she's looking at me, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this 20-pound little girl has control of her whole car, you know? <laughs> and like, the wheels are going off the bus. They're rolling down the road. They're on fire. I'm like, come on. What is going on? For like 20 minutes, it's the wheels on the bus go round, you know? I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, God, do you see what's happening right now? <laughs> right? Lord, help me understand this. Or maybe we need to get off an exit and go to the cannabis factory. I'm just totally kidding, right? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not a pastor that promotes pot. <laughs> no, no. Listen, so it's just like, God, do you know what's happening? And there's this beautiful reality that David's saying, it's awesome, you guys. God knows what's happening in your life, and he loves you. He hymns you in. He will hold you together. You can confide anything. Have you ever felt like if I say this or share this, everything will fall apart? It won't with God. He will hem it all in together. He can handle your chaos and craziness. I promise. He totally can. He's got it covered. He's amazing. 
and to confide and confess and convey and share is this beautiful gift. You see, this beautiful part of our spiritual heritage, David is saying, you get to talk not just to anybody, but the God of the universe. My good friends, Brenton and Jenna Place, have psychological tree clinic. It's in Lake Orion, and they are so busy loving and caring for and talking to people. And I was talking to Brenton, and this, this reality is he's always like, and I ultimately love what we do and love what we get to do, but I just want these people to know that God can hear them too. They can talk to God, and it radically changes everything in their life. And I want to tell you, don't be unseen. Let people know. Let God know what's going on in your life. Even like Lindsay asking to get part of small groups, get in a Bible study, begin to read Scripture, begin to realize that Scripture is speaking about a living God, not a dead God, but a living God that's alive and real and sees you and knows you and can transform your life. And I'm just, I'm trying to compel you and I don't want to hold back. I want you to know he's real. Jesus Christ is real. His Holy Spirit is real and his spirit is amazing. And not only when God sees you, does it mean God knows you. When God sees you, it means this, that God pursues you. This is in a beautiful part too. And I want to read this to you. He says, David says, it's not just that such knowledge is too wonderful me. The fact that the God of the universe knows me are too lofty for me to tame. He says, but here's another thought. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. These are the moments where it's like, God's blessed you, or look at that, that's amazing, or man, God's so good, right? These moments right here that we can make these statements, but it says, but if I make my bed in the depths, that word depths, David is referring to hell. Hell on earth, the threshold of hell, like, Everything is falling apart here in this moment. He says, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me. God, there's darkness in my life. There's, you couldn't possibly follow me to this place. He says, and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as a light to you. David says, do you know in the darkest, most depths of the dungeons of the worst depressed of places in your life, Jesus Christ will follow you, and he will come to you, and he will hold your hand, and he will be with you, and he will turn darkness into light. He is the only one I know that can do that. He will take you to a place where you feel like I am on the edge of chaos and Jesus will step into the middle of the chaos and says, I'm right here and I'm not going anywhere. I'm not gonna leave you. This isn't some religious construct or concept. David is saying this is the real person of Jesus Christ. His spirit will follow you. He will be with you in the great moments and he will be with you in the horrible moments of life. He will be with you when you are walking on a beach in Florida and think everything's great. And six months later, you have a diagnosis for cancer and you're at the chemo treatment clinic across from Sashabal at the McLaren Institute and you're getting chemo and you're on your third installment and it's like living hell. And Jesus says, I'm right there and I'm gonna hold your hand and I'm not gonna let go. I'm right here, I'm not gonna back off. I am with you, I am not going anywhere right now. David says, do you understand what that's like that transforms your life? David says, if you could be there, do you understand when I almost lost my kingdom, when I lost my marriage, when I lost my son, when my children couldn't stand me, when everything was falling apart, Jesus was there in the abyss and he wouldn't leave me. And he sang words out of conviction and fire in his soul. And he's saying, do you know in the worst moments of your life, I'm there and I'm telling you, Forget about religion and anything else. If you can take this life on on your own and you got it handled, great. Don't come here. Don't be here. But if you are a person, a human, at any moment in your life, maybe that moment's right now or that moment will come in the future. It's been in the past and you worry it's going to occur again, that you recognize you need this kind of God in your life. David is saying, do you know that, that God sees you? And he pursues you and he loves you and he will follow you, not just to that threshold or to that moment. He will cross the line that nobody else will and he will go to the darkest places with you and he will shine the brightest light and illuminate and bring hope out of hell in your life. That's what Jesus does. He's amazing. He, I mean, I can't even begin to help you paint the picture. He's unbelievable. And this final thought. 
And I just, I just pray in my heart right now, I just pray that you understand that the God of the universe sees you. And when he sees you, it means that he knows you. That when he sees you, it means that he pursues you. He's not a God of love. Like love would mean nothing if there was no action. Like I love you, but I'm not going to pursue you. That, that's not love. He pursues you. That God made you. Look at this final part that David it shares. It says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Think about this. Before you were a sparkle in your father and mother's eye, God knew you and was creating you. He says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works, he says, I know them full well. He says, fearfully. This is with reverence. This word fearfully means in awe. It means acknowledging that the God of the universe, David is saying, do you know? I don't know if you believe, but I, David's like, I believe. And do you know? And I want you to believe the God of the universe like loves you in an unbelievable way. He fearfully made you. He wonderfully made you. It means of all creation, you're the crown of his creation. And he is for you, he is not against you, that he made you and he created you. He says, I didn't just see you, but I made you. He says, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made. I was made in the secret place when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You are unique. You are one of a kind. You are a masterpiece. You are not a mess. You are a work that God loves and is redeeming and is restoring and is renewing and reigniting, right? Right? He is transforming. He is doing something incredible in your life. And when he sees you, it means he knows you, he pursues you, but it means he made you. And he is like the inventor, the innovator, the author of our life. The psychologists grapple with two major questions that humanity struggles with often. It's this, it's what am I here for? This would be purpose. And the other part is this, not just that, but where do I come from? My origin. Where do I come from? The idea of my origin. Because this reality is true, is Marie and I are part of foster care and loving children and caring for them and helping out, there's a real reality that children can feel abandoned if they don't know their origin, if they don't understand where they come from. Who is my mother? Who is my father? This is part of our human design. We must know that. And so when David is saying, man, God, you see me and you, you, you know me, you know all my hurts and my pains and everything, Jesus. And God, you pursue me, you'll, you'll follow me anywhere, which means I know you love me. You'll never give up on me. Jesus says, even to the ends of the world, I'll follow you, I'll be with you, I promise. <laughs> I'm with you. But this part, David says, don't miss this part. God made us, created us. I don't know where you are in that belief spectrum. I, I'm believing that God created me, that I was innovated, I was created, that I was initiated by a living God. And that he loves me and he made me and he formed me and he shaped me and he created me for a purpose. That he made me on purpose, for a purpose in my life. And this idea of where do I come from is a big deal, my origin. David's saying this shapes everything that I know that I'm not just lost. I'm not an orphan. I'm not forgotten. I'm not marginalized. I'm, I'm not going to give up. I have a heavenly father that loves me, that is all about me, right? Like this is a big deal. Like God, you don't miss a thing. You are all for me. And Solomon says that eternity is written in our hearts. Solomon acknowledges, the wisest man to live, acknowledges this moment and says, look, this is a big deal. I acknowledge the reality that we are eternal beings in a human condition. And I want to tell you that God, he is the author of our life and our faith. And here's what's great about him. He's not just the author, but he's the finisher of it too. He's not just an author, but he's an advocate. He is with us wherever we go. And he's for us. And he's not just an advocate. He is an adorer. He loves us. You know what's incredible about God? That he loves you so much you cannot even imagine. He loves you so much that there's nothing you could do more to get him to love you more. Do you hear that? There's nothing you could do more to make God love you more. There's no religious hoops. There's no small groups you got to sign up for. We want you to sign up for small groups. But, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to do more to get more of God's love. And here's what's even more spectacular. There's nothing you can do to goof that up either. There's nothing you could do to make God love you less. Well, what if I, nope, he still loves you more. 
Well, if he knew, nope, he does know all that. Remember, we just talked about that. Well, he wouldn't follow me in this part of my marriage where it's broken or this part of my depression. The de- yep, he would perceive that there's nothing you can do to make him love you less. There's nothing you can do to make him love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make him love you less. Isn't that incredible? You get his full, unfailing, unwavering, unconditional love. He says, you're not unseen, you are seen, and I love you like you wouldn't even possibly imagine. And David is saying, you guys, in Psalm 139, he's pouring out his heart. He's saying, look, this changed me. This radically transformed my life. When I was in the pits, God knew it, and he still loved me. When I was in the depth of the pit, he pursued me and pulled me out of it. And then he reminded me that I was made by him, that he's not done with me, that he loves me. This is incredible truth that transforms our life, that God is not done, that he's the God of not just the fabulous moments and the God of our failures, he's there, but he's the God of our future and he knows that too. And he doesn't miss a thing at all, at all. And I wanna encourage you as the team is gonna come out and uh, they're gonna lead us in a couple different songs. But this one is called You Don't Miss a Thing and it's unbelievable. And then we've got this song called Reckless Love and this kind of love and this kind of amazing part of who God is radically changes our lives. I tell you something cool. I've always dreamed for us, for our community, I've really wanted to say, what would it look like if we could be in one day in this like permanent spot in Clarkston and we could reach more than just Clarkston, but Clarkston could be this beautiful epicenter and we could reach people all around like Davisburg and Grand Blanc and Waterford in an even bigger way now, right? And Holly and all over the place. And what if we could be in the sports center in this amazing spot um, and we could do that? That would just be unbelievable if that was possible to do that. And I really, through COVID and and things begin to look bleak, and we're like, oh my gosh. And, I, and there's a lot of parts of my life where I just thought, maybe this was just not God's, your dream. Maybe this is my dream, and it's never going to happen. And So anyhow, a couple, probably about two months ago, we were hanging out. We did a Kingdom Men's Bible study, and uh, we did this Kingdom Men's Bible study, and this young man showed up to it, and he had not been to our church in about three and a half, four years, and uh, he just felt compelled. He wanted to be part of a, a study and get more connected to God. And right and he, about the things we're talking about, he wanted God to know him and connect. He wanted this to go on in his life. And, and so we we're talking. Somebody said, hey, are we ever going to have a permanent spot? You know, and I said, man, I hope so. And I, we'd love to do a sports center. And we'd love to be right in the middle of it with the church and a, and a daycare center and all sorts of stuff. So we could be right in the middle of the community and reaching tons of people. And, and his eyes started to well up. And all of a sudden, he looked over, he said, can I talk to you afterwards? I said, yeah. He said, you're not going to believe it. He said, I've been praying about, and God's put on my heart for about three and a half years and to build a big sports center in Clarkston and to, to do something amazing. And he said, he said, and everything you talked about is everything that's been on my heart. And he pulled out these plans, and he pulled out all this stuff. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is everything we've been dreaming about and talking about. Are you, are you kidding me? He says, no, I can't believe it either. And we just were like beside ourselves. And Right now, it's a dream, and we got to press into the details and figure out what would happen. But I, I realized, I'm like, God, you don't miss anything. Like, you're paying attention to my pains and my problems and my hurts. But, God, you're also, you're breathing in new life into my hopes and my dreams. You really are a God that whispers into the details of my heart. You whisper and breathe into the dreams of the things that you desire to see our community and our families and our kids and our grandparents and everybody to experience and understand. I thought, how is this possible? Because God doesn't miss anything because he knows everything and he's pursuing everything in our life. And he made us and he created us and he formed us and he shaped us. And he wants to set us on this beautiful trajectory of a life following Jesus that takes us into a place where dreams become true that we couldn't even imagine. Difficulties that we will have in life, but God is walking with us in the middle of those. Isn't that amazing and exciting to think about? Like, man, I love that. And I just wanna tell you, as Ashley and the team come forward, I want you to hear these words. God, you don't miss a thing. Even right now, you see my pains. God, you see my problems. You don't miss a thing. Even in a room of like 10,000 people, God, you don't miss me, overlook me, you see me. And it goes even further, it's not this, that, but God, you see my dreams, you see my hopes, you see my heart, you've seen the things I've given up on and you don't stop, you don't quit, you are with me. I want you to realize that God does not miss you or overlook you. He doesn't miss the thing.
Lord, we thank you that you are a God that sees us, that you are a God that knows us. Even in a crowd of 10,000, you pick us out, Lord. Lord, we're so grateful that you are not a God of indifference. But that your love is relentlessly pursuing after us. We're never left behind. That you'll always leave the one to come for us, God. We are the one, Lord. We are seen and loved deeply by you. Thank you, Jesus. Would you stand with me as we sing? Before I spoke a word, you were singing on me. And you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you read your
sit in that for a second. What we just sang, I know we sing it a lot, but his love is relentlessly pursuing us. There is not a moment we are alone. There is not a moment that we can hide from the love of Jesus. Don't you realize what that means? There is no force more powerful than a love that tracks you down and loves you in the worst parts in the deepest valleys, but also in the highest heights. That is a love worth celebrating and worth worshiping. Thank you for joining us today. And we are just so grateful and excited that you are all here to share in this fall launch with us. And we've got some really wonderful stuff out there for you guys after service. Come connect with us, sign up for groups, get some popcorn and some cookies. Lindsay works super hard on all that stuff for y'all. So we love you guys. Have an amazing weekend. God bless.